Mr. Forbes, thank you so much for joining me. So I'm picking up on an article that you wrote recently for the Business Standard called Innovation, Competition, Ambition, Why Indian Firms Must Invest More in Research and Development. Now, the headline figure here is that Indian industry invests only 0.3% of GDP in in-house R&D compared to a world average of one5 and in the top 2,500 firms that do invest in R&D globally, India has only 23. And we have no presence in six of the top industries, which is technology, hardware, electronics, construction, healthcare, industrials, and industrial engineering. So, uh, and then uh, there are further breakdown in terms of uh, industries like auto and pharmaceuticals, where clearly the numbers are very low. So let me ask you the broader question first. Uh, why is it that Indian companies not or do not invest sufficiently or enough in R&D? So it's a question that I've tried to, you know, first of all, Govan, great to be with you. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of your of your show. It's the way I have, uh, I, it's the way I start my day every morning uh, before you. I go for my shower. So I've tried to answer that question over the last few years. And the way I've tried to answer the question is by talking to friends in industry and asking them the question. You know, instead of saying, sharing with them the data and then saying, uh, why is it that we invest as little as we do? And I think the answer is shifting a little in that we see more and more Indian firms that are starting to get more serious about R&D, but not enough yet to show in the overall aggregate data. So it's still, when I first came up with this 0.3% calculation, um, that's about five, six, maybe six, seven years ago. Uh, and the 0.3% is still 0.3%. Uh, so we haven't yet shifted uh, substantially enough in terms of the number of Indian firms uh, that are making serious R&D commitments. There are individual firms, but not enough firms and not enough big firms, especially to for it to show in the data. So when I've asked why, I think the general sense I get is that firms actually think they're investing a reasonable amount in R&D. Um, they, they will come back with answers like, well, we do a lot of R&D, but it doesn't show in the data because it's R&D that's done on the shop floor. Um, and it's shop floor innovation, which doesn't show in the official figures. Uh, that's true, but it's also true for firms worldwide. Um, the the shop floor innovation that happens worldwide doesn't show in the R&D data for other countries too. So the comparison is still relevant of 0.3 to 1.5. Um, even if there is some undercounting that takes place, there's undercounting that takes place elsewhere too. So I think it's a mindset issue more than anything else. And mindset sounds like a cop-out. It sounds like, a you know, because how do you change mindsets? You change mindsets, I think, with data. And the data that I've tried to use is to go on sort of ad nauseum about this 0.3, 1.5% comparison to then try to get firms to do a benchmarking exercise for themselves with the top 10 or 20 firms worldwide in their industry. And then say, you know, how many, what do we spend on R&D relative to the top 20, 10, 20 in the industry? How many R&D engineers do we have? Uh, how, many, how does that compare with engineers worldwide? How does, the, how does the qualifications of the engineers compare? And how do the outcomes compare in terms of the number of new products released each year, uh, the, the proportion of, let's say, new products launched within the last three or five years in total sales, um, and using a bunch of benchmarking metrics as the way of trying to get this point across that there are big gaps between where we are as uh, Indian industry in our investments in R&D and where world industry and the leading firms in our sectors actually are. Again, there are exceptions. There are Indian firms that take R&D very seriously, but unfortunately, they're too few to show in the overall aggregate data. And we need to become much more R&D intensive, much more focused on R&D. And we can talk about the benefits that would flow as a result. Right. And so let me put that question first straight away um, and maybe word it a little differently, which is that what are companies losing out by not investing in it? And then could be the follow up, which is what is the perception currently on whether they're losing out or not losing out? Yeah. So 
you know, the, clearly the what we're losing out on is the ability to capture what economists call innovation rents. Um, innovation rents are uh, uh, are the extra the extra price you can get from the market uh, because your product is differentiated because uh, you do something your product does something either looks better does something better has functionality that is a, that is very different to what everyone else has on offer and as a result you can charge an innovation rent you can charge a premium over what others charge. And that's what firms seek when they invest in R&D. Um, and there are, there's a second piece to it, which is one is the innovation rent and the attractiveness of being able to sell at a higher price. The second is being able to access markets that one otherwise would not be able to access. Particularly true of international markets. Um, if you look at many sectors, um, we've done some studies. Uh, we have we run a think tank uh, called the Center for Technology Innovation and Economic Research here in Pune, and we've done some studies from the center, uh, interviewing Indian firms on competition that they face from China. And quite interestingly, we find that in many many sectors, firms do not face competition from China. Uh, and we said this is rather unusual. How come? Right. Um, and then when you actually talk to the firms in some detail, you find that in the products where they face competition from China, they've tended to exit those markets. Those markets have tended to be for somewhat more sophisticated technology areas. And they then focus on areas where there isn't that competition. So it's really been a move away from some quite attractive areas uh, as a result of uh, of not uh, uh, of not wanting to compete with firms that are more significant investors in uh, in technology. So I think for two reasons, the two the two reasons why one should invest a lot more in in R and D and in technology is first because you can get innovation rents, you can sell at a premium, and second because you can access markets that you otherwise would not be able to, particularly world markets. Those are the two compelling big reasons and rationale for investing in R&D. No, there's a third reason, uh, which is a threat reason. Um, and that if you don't invest in R&D, the chances are that someone else will come along and innovate, will come up with something that's better, and your existing customers will be lost to that competitor. So the threat of displacement, the threat of being pushed out of a particular area um, is a very compelling argument too. Um, it's, it's, it's a negative argument, if you like, but that's a negative inducement that can be more powerful sometimes than the two positive things that I mentioned. So if, uh, uh, if we were to go a little deeper into auto, which you've talked about, and you said how the four Indian firms, that's Tata Motors, Mahindra's, Bajaj, and TBS, they figure in the top 2,500 R&D investors in the world, spend 3.8% of their turnover on R&D, but that drops to 1% if you take out Tata Motors' JLR subsidiary, which is uh, sitting in the United Kingdom. So that means it's uh, essentially 1%. Now, why is it that firms like these, which are clearly in very competitive markets, including in India, but competing against global brands, are not able to or do not see the, let's say, the incentive or the push to actually invest more. So, so the so global R and D spend glo global R and D investment by auto firms um, is typically three, four, five percent uh, of sales. Um, so it's uh, it's it's significantly higher than what we have in India. Um, one of the reasons is that R and D is more expensive in other parts of the world. Um, the main cost in R&D is the cost of engineers. Um, our cost of engineers in that sense is lower. And given that lower cost, um, we can get the same results at a lower cost. Right. So that's one that's one element. But that, in a sense, should be an argument for doing that much more. So for actually scaling R&D that much more, provided the returns to R&D are attractive, and all the data shows that the returns to R&D are actually very attractive. There was a World Bank study that was done about 
five years ago, I think, uh, called the Innovation Paradox. And the study tried to estimate the returns to R&D. And it came up with numbers that were upwards of 80%. Now, if you have an 80% return, I mean, it's a no-brainer. You don't even try to calculate the return. You just invest uh, because it's such an attractive investment that uh, you want to do it as soon as possible. So the question then again is, why do you have this innovation paradox? Why do you not invest enough? And it's because of these perceptions, these perceptions that, well, um, I'm already doing enough. Uh, you know, I, I'm doing as much as I can. Uh, I'm doing as much as uh, not, I don't think any firm is saying they're doing as much as they can afford. I think they, I think if you ask firms, by the way, and you ask them a question, and I've asked them this question in a few cases, that how many R&D projects have been proposed to them that they have turned down? Um, the answer is generally almost none. So it's not that there is this big appetite for R&D within the firm that the firm is unwilling to invest in. It's that the firm does not have an engine in place to generate enough of those proposals of what would be worthy R&D projects. And I think that's where firms will need to start. They'll need to start with putting people into R&D who can think both from a technical perspective and from a business perspective um, and say, these are the kinds of projects that we should start experimenting with and start uh, investing in. Um, a second question is how many projects go nowhere? Uh, how many projects fail? Um, and my sense is that the proportion of projects, of R&D projects that fail in Indian industry is much lower than the proportion of R&D projects that fail internationally. Um, now, you might think that's a very good thing. Um, but in R&D, I think it's a bad thing. Um, because if R&D projects, if not, if you can't point to several R&D projects that have gone nowhere, it's probably because we haven't tried to do enough cutting edge things. Um, and in a sense, uh, having some level of failure of R&D projects would be a reflection of us trying to do enough. Right. So if you were to look on the demand side, which is where I'm assuming a lot of other uh, responses would come in, which is to say that the market doesn't need it. Uh, the market cannot afford anything. The market is not looking for any more innovation as we can see at this point of time for uh, this class of products or, the, uh, or this, this category of products. I, you know, I don't think that's true. Um, I think in sector after sector, uh, we've demonstrated that people want new things. You know, just, uh, well, your show this morning, uh, uh, Govind, <laughs> uh, you had an interview and you were talking about auto sales, right? And uh, you had this comment on auto sales where I think it said that, look, it was almost in passing, but it was, we've seen that auto sales have become vibrant of particular models when these new models come in. So if you have a firm that introduces a lot of new models, that's the firm that sees growth in sales. Um, so I think that's that's true of industry after industry after industry. You know, that, uh, that the way in which, you know, a classic, take the counter argument. Why would you replace um, a 10-year-old Premier Padmini um, with a new Premier Padmini, which looks exactly the same and performs exactly the same. That was the state of Indian auto for many decades. Um, there was no incentive to invest in a new model. But when you have a really attractive new model that comes out every two years, uh, then every five or six or seven years, you want to invest in a new car because uh, you want something which has if nothing else, it simply looks different and looks very attractive relative to the car that you're currently driving. So uh, I think newness, um, innovation, new functionalities, new performance uh, is what drives uh, consumers. Um, it's what drives consumers. It's what drives industrial users. Um, that's, uh, that's the nature of uh, creating attractive markets in firm after firm. And 
it's as true in India as it is in markets worldwide. So, and when one, when one says, and you do hear this argument, I agree with you, you hear this argument that, well, are people willing to pay for it? Okay, I mean, you can't, you can't price your products so high that, uh, you know, you limit the number that would afford, can, that can afford the product. But does that mean that firms and individuals are not willing to pay 10 or 20 or 30 percent more for something that is a lot better and different? I think it's it's that's something that's been proven again and again that uh, consumers are willing to even in price sensitive markets. So like you're, ours. Uh, you're therefore saying that there is uh, there is hubris and uh, that is one reason why firms who particularly are doing well because the other thing that struck me with the examples that you've quoted or most of them is that they're all very cash rich. So that none of yeah. them have a problem of uh, finding the funds to do more R&D. I mean, if, 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 of course, such projects did come up. You take the take the IT services industry. The IT services industry has no no shortage of funds. Um, it continues to be very profitable. It continues to have a lot of cash sitting in the bank. Our investments in R and D within the if you take the top ten IT services firms in India, um, they invest under one percent of turnover in R and D. Um, <coughs> if you take the top ten Chinese firms. Uh, in IT services, they invest 8%. Um, there isn't a good reason why there's that gap. Okay. So, you've also said that, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, where, again, the top five Indian firms invest about 6% of sales, uh, the world average is 17%. Yeah. So, uh, no, pharmaceuticals, one would uh, assume, is obviously an area where there has to be research happening all the time. Or alternatively, we are obviously doing more contract manufacturing and therefore no real pressure to do R&D beyond a point. But the other uh, uh, question I have is the talent to do R&D is also there in India, but maybe it's not in these firms. Is that something that also comes up? So the talent to do R&D is, is clearly available in India to a large, much greater extent. I, I don't remember the exact number. I've I've written about this, but if I remember, I think it's around, I think it's around three quarters of the top 500 firms in the world have R&D development centers in India. So the top 500 firms in the world think that there's an abundance of R&D talent available in India. So there's R&D talent available in India. Um, and this R&D talent that's available uh, should be seen more and more in employed in Indian firms. So we should have hundreds of Indian firms that are each employing thousands of R&D engineers. Uh, why should it be more foreign firms that are the thousand person R&D functions in India? Now, the nature of the R&D that these foreign firms do tends to be more routine than the broad conceptual R&D that's needed and then a lot of the detailed R&D that's available. So we have many more people without question who can do the detailed um, high volume R&D that's needed. Um, and we do have some constraints on the more conceptual broader R&D, but that's more a matter of learning than anything else. Um, we have to learn those skills and we learn those skills only if we try to we try to acquire them by by coming up with products that are truly differentiated and unique. Um, it's it takes a while. It takes I mean, I can say from our own experience as a firm, uh, it took us five years before we had a regular flow of new products coming out of R&D that we could be proud of. Um, you know, you get you in, in your first couple of years, you're putting a lot in, you're getting a relatively little out. It starts getting better and better and better as you learn how to identify what kind of product differentiation um, is both possible for the firm to do and attractive to customers to buy. So I'm going to uh, come to the triggers in a moment of, uh, you know, what makes companies, uh, you know, actually go ahead. But uh, the other point that you made earlier about, you know, companies that vacate 
a space rather than go head on into competition with, let's say, a Chinese product. Again, uh, two parts to it. I, mean, I wonder if you could illustrate that uh, with any examples. And secondly, uh, why perhaps, again, is it, is, it the, is it a more intangible issue that we have to tackle here rather than the tangible? No, I think, I, I think this is a very uh, tangible issue that we have to tackle. Um, are there examples that I can point to? I think we could look at the consumer durable space. Um, and I think you'll find uh, not only some categories where we've sort of exited markets rather than compete with Chinese firms, um, but I think in some cases, uh, we've exited the part of the market that is the most attractive and innovative. Um, and once you exit that market, then getting back in it is tough because you lose uh, that talent that you need to build on uh, to really keep adding functionality and features. Um, <clears throat> there is a second piece there. A lot of consumer durable products have increasingly incorporated sophisticated electronics. Um, and electronics is an area where we have very weak innovation capabilities. Um, you know, it's one of those one of those 10 leading sectors worldwide, electronic hardware, uh, one of the 10 leading innovation sectors worldwide. And it's a sector where we have zero firms in the top 2,500. Um, and uh, more and more, you need electronics capability running across sectors if you want to be cutting edge. The same is true now in auto. Uh, you know the uh, the number of chips in a in a car or even motorcycle is growing all the time, um, and the electronics and the interfaces and so on are increasingly electronics, um, and um, we don't have a good capability yet. So I think we're, it's a nascent capability. It's something that's starting to improve. Um, I think as it improves more substantively, um, we will see us starting to be able to get back into some of these sectors like consumer durables, which we've kind of vacated, at least the high end of consumer durables with a lot of automation. Uh, that's currently provided by these electronic uh, these electronic capabilities. So one of the things that you've argued uh, uh, is that the reason maybe there is a lower incentive to invest in R&D is protection. And uh, you can, of course, take it upon yourself and say, I'll go and compete in international markets and, this, and thus self-incentivize yourself to invest in R&D. But that may not happen in many cases or most cases. So my question really is, uh, what then can be the big triggers? Uh, and let me ask you about both triggers. So one is internal, which is that you as a company wake up one morning and say, we have to do this, and you quoted your own example. Uh, and second is external. It could be policy led, or it could be uh, led by uh, opening up of, I mean, policy, which could include, of course, lowering of tariffs, but there could be something else as well. So, you know, it's ideal if the firm chooses to do it itself, right? Because you're, you know, you're making that choice and you deliberately seek um, more demanding users. The more demanding users can be those within the country who otherwise import product um, or the demanding users can be overseas. So <coughs> both, are, both are fine, um, and, but it's ideal if you choose to do it yourself. But I would argue that it's really a policy question more than anything else, because being competitive is not a choice that should be left to firms. It should be forced on them. And the way in which you force competitiveness on firms is by removing tariffs. Um, and we can make various arguments and say, <clears throat> you know, we need a level playing field. Um, our electricity prices are so high. Our infrastructure has these issues. But then we should argue and demand a level playing field. Uh, and we should argue and demand better infrastructure, much of which we've been getting, um, better electricity supply to some extent, which we've been getting. Um, and really, and if you look at, you know, the bureaucratic overload, which is which was significant and continues to be 
as significant in terms of ease of doing business, we should demand that that improve as a way of enabling us to compete instead of then saying, okay, because we have these impediments, protect us. So I think, I think getting rid of tariffs and seeing a progressive reduction in tariffs is the only way in which competitiveness can be actually forced on Indian industry. Um, we had seen tariffs come down to an average rate of 13% a few years ago. In the last uh, six or seven years, it's gone from 13% to 18%. Um, and uh, uh, that's one of the higher rates in the world uh, for among all emerging markets. Um, and it directly affects, by the way, our ability to compete as firms. Um, an economist uh, would use a phrase, uh, which is a tax on imports is a tax on exports, because even if you can import items for export duty free, you can't import everything. It's too cumbersome. So, for example, if you're a garment firm, you might import, which, you're, which is making garments for export. You might import the fabric um, such that it can be converted in for exports and so you import it duty free. But you won't bother with the thread and the buttons and the liners and everything else because it's too cumbersome and that makes you less competitive overall. So a tax on imports is a tax on exports. If we want to be a vibrant, strong international player in markets around the world, we have to reduce tariffs. Right. So, uh, so you said internally, one should really, uh, you know, uh, take it upon oneself as, a, as an organization and really not waste time. <laughs> the external trigger that you're saying is tariff. Is there anything else? Free trade agreements. <clears throat> Another policy area is free trade agreements. And <clears throat> it's encouraging that in the last, um, <clears throat> in that in the last three years, we've turned around and have started signing free trade agreements again. We've signed a free trade agreement with the UAE, a very limited agreement with Australia, um, and we have a free trade uh, a, a free trade agreement with EFTA, uh, four countries in 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 Europe, um, and uh, we have big agreements underway and is being discussed with the UK and with the EU. All of this is very welcome, but the world's supply chains are strongly Asia-based. Um, yes, China playing a big part in them, but Asia-based, it's not only China, it's uh, South Korea, it's Japan, it's Indonesia, it's Thailand, it's Malaysia, Vietnam, all are part of these supply chains. And we've sort of turned our back on Asia um, by dropping out of the RCEP Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement um, a few years ago. It's the most attractive economic region in the world. Um, you know, the ASEAN, this, the Association of Southeast Asian countries alone doubles Indian GDP. Um, if you add in uh, Japan and South Korea and Australia and New Zealand, uh, you add another two elements of Indian GDP. And of course, if you add in China, that's another five. So it's the fastest growing region in the world. It's the most attractive market in the world. Um, and uh, it's where a lot of manufacturing takes place. And if we want to be part of these supply chains, we have to, again, look at Asia as a market that we should be engaging with for free trade discussions and free trade agreements. Um, we, we didn't do RCEP, but let's look at uh, uh, the, uh, what's it called, the, 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 these horrible acronyms, uh, you know, the Comprehensive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership or whatever it's called, which is the, 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 the agreement that came out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership when the U.S. left it. So, <coughs> Right. Uh, Mr. Forbes, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, Govind. Enjoyed that very much. Yeah. Thank you.